Hello and welcome everybody. Thank you for being with us today. We are broadcasting live. I feel like a, a TV channel um, from, uh, I think Steve Stevens in New Mexico and Kim, yes. you're in California. I'm in Orange County, California, yes. Orange, Orange County. And as many of you know, uh, I've uh, decided to spend the summer in Park City, Utah, which I'm just so happy about. And so uh, it's a glorious day here. And uh, um, we, we're really grateful that you've come and spent the afternoon with us here for, for a bit. Um, we've got about 45 minutes. Uh, we'll stay on longer if there's more questions. Um, uh, I have to give a, a full credit and it's all Brando Crespi's fault. My good friend who is uh, the biochar king and also somebody who's very thoughtful, smart, and uh, I can call him a dear friend. So he's the reason why we know Santa Fe Farms. As some of you may know, we've chatted with Steve, Stephen Pryor uh, in a webinar about a month and a half ago, and we're glad to have him back. The uh, enormous amount of progress that's been made with Santa Fe Farms uh, is, is really quite astounding. And uh, again, I don't have skin in the game here. I might eventually, but for the moment, I'm not promoting Santa Fe Farms because it does me good. I'm just, it, it is pretty astounding what they're up to, not just in terms of economic benefit to investors, but, um, and you'll see shortly, if you haven't already seen it, uh, um, society and climate and so forth. And so we'll get in the weeds in that in a minute. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we can't hear or see you, uh, but we certainly welcome all your questions. So if they come to mind, don't wait, just put them in the chat box or the Q&A and we'll get to as many as possible. We have a lot of folks that are going to be listening in today, but we'll do as much as we can. We're going to have a, 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 some uh, presentation documents, but uh, we're going to definitely have this as a, more of a, a dialogue uh, so we can understand the opportunity uh, uh, as opposed to just going through a, a, a deck. So we're going to have some dialogue. And so we welcome, again, your, your questions and comments. The, they all are welcome. Um, so with that, Kim, am I giving it to you or am I giving it to you, Steve? Oh, well, I'm happy. I'm happy. get a kick off. Yeah. Okay. Welcome, Steve. Once again, so great to have you. Take it away. Uh, it's nice to be here. Um, and can everyone see my screen? We know because as long as you can see it, Arthur, I assume everyone else can see it. Yeah. Great. Um, so just, just to start, just for fun here, a, a quote from Buckminster Fuller. Um, and um, what we're realizing about the hemp industry and we'll talk more about it in detail, that it really is something new and something novel. Um, and it touches so many aspects of both agriculture and climate and animal feed and protein. And so what we're committed to doing is building that new model, right? Rather than saying that, you know, let's get rid of this all, we'll just build a new model that demonstrates it's, it's better for our society and for our wallets than the existing model. Um, so, I'm going to just, this is the only time I'm going to read a slide, but I'll read this slide because I think we've worked hard on getting the language correct to really describe what we at Santa Fe Farms really are. And that's a vertically integrated company leading the growth and development of the industrial hemp industry. Remember in our last conversation, people often think of hemp as, as what that thing we all smoked in college, but it, it's really not. It's really quite something entirely different. Santa Fe Farms spans the growth transformation impact. Those are three really important words for us. Um, of industrial hemp into key wellness, chemical and physical ingredients and components, which can be incorporated into thousands of products and categories, including health, human and animal nutrition, agriculture, building materials, paper and packaging, plastics and advanced carbons. In many ways, and we'll talk a little bit more, Arthur, about this, it's a miraculous plant in terms of the number of uses that it has. Santa Fe Farms will be both a net negative carbon business, we'll talk about carbon a lot this morning, and an important source of offsets available to other enterprises seeking to reduce their carbon footprint to meet ESG goals or regulatory requirements. So uh, the logo on the right uh, is, is sort of what, what and how we represent ourselves, the snake, the star, and the white buffalo, but importantly, the words on the outside, sustainability is our mission, carbon is our focus, hemp, is our vehicle and Indian country is our partner. And we'll talk more about all those this morning. 
Uh, oh, I'll, I'll go, I should go backwards just to say here. Here's the the you have to say this every time so people don't take you seriously, right? This protects everybody that 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 what we say is what we believe. Um, so the hemp story really is a carbon story, um, and that we we've come to understand that ourselves. It wasn't how we started. We we we've come to learn this. Um, you know, each year that we put just under. 50 gigatons of CO2 into our atmosphere, that's 50 billion tons a year. That's the net contribution. And so when you hear about going to net zero or you know, carbon neutrality, it means we have to find a way to conduct industry and conduct life on this planet producing 50 billion tons less CO2. It turns out that we're gonna to have to use nature-based solutions for at least part of that. We can you know, eventually drive all drive electric cars, there's things that we can do, but regenerative farming and reforestation and other natural things are going to be an incredibly important part of that carbon neutrality. Um, one of the things that we have now discovered and is really becoming, I think, the driving force behind the hemp movement is that an acre of hemp, industrial hemp, will sequester eight and a half tons of CO2 per acre per year. Compare that to the Amazon rainforest, and you can see that's two and a half tons. So remarkably, remarkably, planting hemp is more effective in taking CO2 out of the air than planting an, an acre of Amazon rainforest. So our commitment really is to reducing the global footprint, the carbon footprint across Indian country, which um, Arthur alluded to, and then across the world generally. Um, why hemp? We, we, we've talked about its carbon sequestration pieces, that's obvious, but you know, it's also an incredible industrial product. And we're just taking a couple of the possible uses of this product. Um, human and animal consumption, the, the grain and the seed of this plant are incredibly nutritious. They contain all the uh, amino acids necessary and to do that we don't produce ourselves. Um, and have an ideal mixture of uh, omega threes and sixes. Um, it can be used in biofuels and in biomaterials for a whole range of things, composites and things of that sort. It can be used in textiles. Just to give you some perspective, on the right hand side here, those are um, just four of the marketplaces. How big those markets are today, and I describe them as bigger than bread boxes, and then what that market for hemp could be. So we're talking about a plant that could have a addressable market somewhere between 150 billion and 1.2 trillion dollars in terms of the areas they attack. So a very, very robust opportunity for, for investment um, complemented by its ecological advantage. Um, so Steve, hold so, on one second. I don't wanna call anybody out, but if I am confused, maybe others, can you jump back to that uh, slide? Is the header on these columns switched? No, the, the um, yeah, no, they're, they're not switched. The, the current market, that's for the entire established part market. The smaller oh, numbers- Oh, I got it, got it, got it. Is got the it. potential that okay. we'd say what portion of that might be hemp driven. I got it, okay. Uh, yeah. um, so we're creating a reliable, scalable, and integrated industrial hemp supply chain. That's what we're doing. Um, and we've talked about the way we're doing that. It, it has a, a lot of benefits that we've talked about. I wanna begin to focus a little bit on the um, partnership with Indian country. Um, as I think you know that when the hemp business sort of came back to life in 2018, people talked about sort of the social justice aspect of it and focused primarily on the inner city where the African-American community had been um, probably the most damaged by the war on drugs and people smoked a joint and got put into jail for 10 years. And so when the hemp business began to roll back out, the talk was about the African-American and Latino inner city communities and making sure that those communities had opportunities as marijuana became legal. That, 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 that's a very important and noble uh, attribute. We're not in the cannabis part of this, right? We're in the industrial part. And what we began thinking about is that, what do you need to, to grow? What do you need to sort of drive the hemp business? And the answer is you need farmland, you need land, because this is a product that you grow, not in greenhouses, but at scale. And when we looked around the map and sort of said, where would we like to put our emphasis? You know, we're here in New Mexico. I developed a, 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 a great friendship with my friend, Robert Frawa, who is um, a Hemez Indian. And we said, you know what? Native Americans control 150, uh, 55 million acres in the US and have a long history as stewards of the land. Why don't we think of the hemp opportunity really as one driven by Indian country? 
and we as a company have committed to that. Um, they are our partner. We're working with the Osage Indian tribe in Oklahoma. We're working with the Akimas and everything we do, we think about in the lens from a social justice perspective that what can we do? And I think, as you know, if there is a minority group that has gotten the short end of the stick, Native Americans have been treated in ways that really are unconscionable by our society. And most of us didn't study this history. I'm just learning this history myself in, in school. So a lot of what we do has that focus, that supply chain, but through the, through the Native American story. So here's the slide well, that really describes our business. And it, you as an investor should think of our business as really having three arms, right? The first is growth. And that means physical growth, um, you know, a cultivation. This is a plant. You have to grow this plant. You need to understand the genetics of the plant because depending on what you want to use it for, you'd use different genetics. You need to demonstrate that you know how to grow, right? If farmers are going to follow you, you have to be. So we have uh, an operation in um, farming. Just to go back to genetics, we bought one of the most significant and well-known um, seed genetics firms in the United States in the hemp space called High Grade Hemp Seed and integrated it into our cultivation division. We partner with farmers. It turns out that farmers want to be farmers. They don't, that's why they're farmers. It's hard enough business to be in. So basically we supply seed, we put, supply standard operating procedures, we help them and then we buy their offtake. So this is the industrial farming model, right? It's not a model that says the little mom and pop farm wants to do everything themselves. They don't, they want to grow and they want to know that their product can be sold. And so we focus on a supply chain in which we provide seed, provide them the know-how, let them farm and then buy their product. Um, and that's really the brokerage. We then broker that product in different ways. You can see also an analytics lab. We own the um, what is now one of one in New Mexico analytic labs for the testing of cannabis and, and hemp. Um, although we do testing all throughout the entire area, um, that's a business in its own right, as well as providing us data. You know, you don't use this plant in its original form. You got to convert it. It's not like growing corn where you cut the corn and then eat the corn, right? This is something that needs to be transformed. You have to separate it to its components, whether that be flour or fiber or hemp. And so we have a series of operating businesses looking at processing, anywhere from processing our own to developing machinery that we then sell to other farms and other farmers for the purpose of helping them process their products. Now, one of the things that remember here is a little history for those of you who may not know, this plant was subject to prohibition for 90 years. So for the last 90 years, which means no one, there's no one alive today that actually grew this plant um, or, or very few. Um, it became legal in 2019 to grow again. So we don't even have the machinery, let alone the know-how to actually separate the fiber from the herd. And so there's a whole effort to make sure that if you understand supply chain, how do you get that machinery? The best decortication machinery comes out of Europe and China. We don't even make them in the United States. So we're looking at how to do that in a way that makes more sense. Because if you're going to grow millions of acres of hemp someday, you're going to have to be able to treat it. The most important, though, is really the impact. What do you do? You've grown it. You've processed it. And so today, Santa Fe Farms is focusing on wellness and health, building products, and carbon-based products. You know, Arthur, you mentioned... Um, uh, in your discussion with Brando. Brando is one of the leading experts in the world on biochar, which is a product that a carbon product that is generated from um, waste materials and biomass. There's tremendous applicability here, not just by the way for hemp, but hemp biomass makes a very specific biochar. So today those three blocks, wellness, building products and carbon, we are deeply involved in that. However, you saw in this little white outline is where we're heading. Um, Human nutrition, you can all go buy hemp hearts at Whole Foods tomorrow or today after this call. Um, they're nutritious, they taste great. Um, they should be in every salad you eat. Um, and so you're gonna see more and more. In a world where plant-based proteins become more and more important, um, Impossible Beef, you know, these are these multi-billion dollar businesses. They all use plant-based protein. If you look at hemp protein, Probably next to the fava bean, it's the most important and most useful and widespread, the highest concentrations of protein and omega-3s and 6s. So there's going to be a big market in using this, and you'll be eating hemp burgers one of these days. Um, animal nutrition. Uh, we grow 90 million acres of corn in the United States, two-thirds of it's fed to animals. 
Um, it turns out it's not great for either the animals or the environment. And we think hemp will be an important component um, in animal nutrition. That goes through a process with the FDA before it's added. We're starting with chicken feed, but that's sort of probably within the year. Um, the state of Montana has already passed the rule. So we're going to see hemp as part of the diet of animals. Um, animal bedding today, um, the hemp, the, the center of the hemp is used for bedding for animals for all the way from uh, horses to cats. Um, pulp and paper, I think you all know that we cut down trees to make paper. It's not very efficient, it's very expensive, and it's ecologically a disaster. Um, uh, an acre of hemp can produce four times as much paper as an acre of forest. Um, and so we see in the next 20 years a movement towards replacing um, tree-based um, paper. And, and lastly- and, and not to, I'm sorry, Steve, but I think the other component there is that the time it takes to grow the tree to cut it down and the time it, right? So. This plant grows in 98 days. Um, and, a, and a tree, a eucalyptus tree, which is what they're now using for pulp and paper takes between five and seven years. So tremendously effective in terms of that. By the way, there's the, the cost of the machinery to grace the pulp is, is pretty significant in this area. This is not a simply, you don't flip the switch and make the, take the same factory. So a little, little bit of challenge here financially. And then lastly, um, bio additives for plastics. You know, plastics are basically, you know, a, a came out of the petrochemical business. Turns out that there are many, many uses for um, other ways of using and creating these um, plastics. And we would start with the additives. But this second column here is really the advanced carbons business. And I would tell you that this is the shift you've seen in the three years I've been building this business. This is now becoming the story, right? What this plant, on top of all these products you get, it is so good for our environment. And we, so we have a carbon business. We'll announce on Monday a new CEO, an extraordinary gentleman who will be joining us. Um, you have both products that are prospective, meaning what we don't even know what we can yet make out of the plant. There are things that we can do. There's the regenerative carbon that exists today, and this is the biochar business. The biochar business can be important. You can see that little arrow. That's a product that today can be sold. Um, and then there's the digital carbons. You're all reading about carbon sequestration and carbon offsets. Um, the, the world believes the carbon offset business will be a hundred billion dollar business a year, right? So this is a company that has to create some CO2 and what they do. It will take a petrochemical business or a mining business or the airline business. Um, and the way we get to carbon neutrality, if we can get there, is they buy carbon offsets. By the way, they can buy them from farmers. We expect Santa Fe Farms to be one of the largest originators of carbon offset credits in the world. That's my goal. That's a five or 10 year goal, but incredibly important. That includes how you trade them. You see there something called the hemp blockchain. We believe that this might be the perfect use, carbon tracking for a uh, blockchain. We have a, a, a sister company that's focused on this to the entire supply chain. And you know, the way the way I think of it is, you can start by the most simplistic way to think about it. Does the soil at the end of the harvesting have more carbon than it did when it started? That happens with hemp. It doesn't happen with lots of plants. And so how do you track it? And that leads us to those four senses and Arthur as we talked. Sustainability is the mission of this company. We're focusing on carbon. Indian country is our partner and hemp is the vehicle. And so in, in many ways, I think this slide boasts best sort of summarizes what we are and where we're going. Just real quickly in those three areas, just about growth, we talked about our genetics businesses, our demonstration farms, our farm partner program. We work with farmers around the United States. By the way, it's gonna turn out that cannabinoid rich farming is gonna end up, in my opinion, in only two or three places in the United States where they have, you know, that's an incredibly um, sort of what I've described it is you want the best farmers with the best machinery in the best places. I think you're going to find out that California and the Central Valley will emerge as where phyto rich, phyto cannabinoid rich hemp will be grown. And then we'll use our brokerage operations to make sure that everyone in the supply chain can make money. Um, in our transformation ideas, and we talked about solutions, we have a group of people that provide consulting. Um, we're going to build a, one of the largest processing and extraction centers. We're still debating exactly where that's gonna go. Um, and that will focus on how to convert the hemp in the most effective and cheapest way, both for chemical extraction, but for the processing, whether it be for textiles or biochar, whatever you might do it. Um, and then largely we're gonna focus obviously on low cost manufacturing. It's just important that for this to be an industry of this nature, we, we, you have to be the low cost producer. Um, 
In terms of the impact, we talked about this here, you know, health and wellness, building products, nutrition, bioplastics, advanced carbons, biochar scent. This is the, the, the think of this as the product set that you'll see from us um, over time. And we have a, a product division. And to be honest, this is a three-year-old industry. Do I think we'll be all of these for everybody? No, is the answer. We will figure out. But, but right now, it's a wide open playing field. And we have research. Kim Kovacs, who though you use on, on, it was recently joined us. Kim is our chief strategist. And it will help us determine which of these areas are the most effective for us, where we think the economics are the best, which can be attained. How do you attract? excited. Um, Kim, it might make sense to take two minutes here to introduce yourself and a little about your background and, and why you're so, from my perspective, perfectly suited for this job. Absolutely. Thank you, Stephen. And yes, an absolute thrill to be here. Uh, this is probably my, my third week, official week here at Santa Fe Farms. Um, having met Stephen and Deanna uh, last year when they joined ArcView. So I was just recently the chairman, chairwoman, and CEO of the ArcView Group, which is an 11-year-old organization that was really focused on the legal cannabis market in the United States. And so they provided a platform, a place for investors and investment to happen, also working in the regulation side and enabling cannabis to be legal. We kicked off, though, our first global hemp day last year, and it really struck me. And what struck me about getting into um, sort of hemp and really understanding what hemp was doing and across the globe, not just here in the, U the U.S., but all of these uses, all of these opportunities, and the fact that it was now legal under the 2018 Farm Bill just created an enormous potential. And in my prior life, I had a startup company that we were producing um, bio-additives that were reducing emissions and working with the fossil fuel industry. And so our customers were ConocoPhillips and Valero and Citgo, and ultimately we were acquired by DuPont. And part of that whole um, experience for me was really getting close to, you know, how these solutions are available. Unfortunately, back in 2000, I was a little early. So I'm really excited. I think we're not early. We're very timely for hemp. It's just, it's a big investment. And so my role here is to work with industry is to work with big oil and gas, big pulp manufacturers, paper manufacturing, and, and work toward a solution together where they're creating an investment opportunity that's long-term and creating really this next hemp superhighway and this next, next industrial revolution. Thanks, Kimmy. You know, Kim, I'm noticing our graphics team must be testing us because I'm looking at the logo over there and see they flipped it backwards. Just now. I think they're probably testing us. Oh, it's backwards. Okay, good. I'll flip it around the other way. Do. We're, we're testing us there. Um, yeah. The last thing I say is obviously we talked about the carbon business. I, again, this is the story that will override all others. And, and from an ESG perspective, I want you to think about an investment that not only is good from an economic perspective, but good for our environment and good from the social justice perspective. And so the three forms of carbon, the, the new carbon, the existing carbon and the carbon credits are all part of, part of, what, we, part of what we're seeing. And, and I see that they also flipped it on this one. Um, so if, if people say, Stephen, what if, what's the most important thing you've accomplished in the, in the two and a half years that we've been driving at that, we have assembled an extraordinary team of individuals. Um, and this is just, just a little bit of a taste. Um, Rick Schalson, who's our chief operating officer, who comes from a 30 year career in industrial machinery, um, speaks fluent Chinese, most of his career spent in Asia. Kim, who you've just met, Jeff Apodaca, who runs our products division, long history in, in media, uh, Jeff's father, interestingly, was the governor of New Mexico, the first governor in the United States to legalize medical marijuana. So he had a long history in, in that area. Deanna Bick, who uh, Kim mentioned, who's our Go chief global engagement officer, focusing the work on Indian country. Isaac Cohen, um, who is our chief information officer, but also will lead our operations and growth. And then Roger Frawa, our partner in the Indian country. Um, so where are we financially? And this is the last slide I have, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, we have um, raised about $10 million in total, um, or are, are slated to have raised 10 million. We have about 2.2 left. We have a, we're have we closing our A3 round. We authorized 100 shares. We've sold about somewhere between 75 and 80 of them. So we have a small tranche left to sell. Um, this will be the last friends and far family round that we do. Um, Kim and I are planning a major industrial raise, which will start in the fall. We'll go to Wall Street 
just a word or two about my background. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, I, I'm not an agriculturalist. I'm, I'm, I've learned a lot about farming and about carbon. Um, I'm basically a financier. Um, came out of 30 years on Wall Street and the insurance industries and other um, of the investment banking spaces. Um, I, I was privileged and have been privileged and lucky enough to build two multi-billion dollar businesses um, in, in both uh, private equity and in the insurance business. So um, while I don't know a lot about farming, I'm learning, I, I, know, I know a reasonable amount about investment and money. So um, I think we have a unique opportunity here to, to build something really quite extraordinary, uh, similar to things that have been built before. So the summary for us here is that we're consolidating the best of breed in this industry. We've acquired four companies in the last six months. There are three acquisitions on our table now. So we, we have an aggressive strategy to put the best people. Um, that's what the thing, the talent we have, I think is as good as anybody. I've put it against anybody in the industry. Um, we have a plan and a pathway for a multi-billion dollar exit. Uh, we, have, we, have, we have ambitious people. Uh, we've done it before. And I think that, that this, this industry calls for that, it's, its consequence. Uh, we're working with regulators, industry leaders, NGOs. You know, there's so much here that deals with indigenous farming, and we're committed to this throughout the world. We're starting in the United States, but we believe there's an opportunity here to, to do well and good. Um, and obviously, the ESG piece, we're talking about not only working with the indigenous um, farmers, but we're also the major industries. I, I think you probably all know that, you know, when they woke up at Exxon two weeks ago, they had three activists on their board of 12 uh, with a focus on now the ESG story and what are you doing? Um, uh, we're helping create what's called the carbon protocol. Um, at the end of the day, carbon the carbon markets will be as next to interest rates, probably the second largest market in the world, because every company needs to buy them and address this. So we're working uh, with a technology basis with one of our partners on really developing what we're going to be calling the carbon protocol. And I'd, I'd summarize, I'd end it by saying that I think we are the hemp carbon thought leaders. There, there are a lot of people in carbon who are really, really sophisticated. There are a lot of people in agriculture, but I'd say that this team and our purpose here is to focus and make sure we are doing the seminal thinking about how carbon is reflected in the products that we create, whether it be building products or new forms of paper or animal feed. Um, so I said, we have, we have about 20 units left. They're $75,000 unit for anyone who's interested afterwards. On the front of this, we'll, we'll distribute this deck or we'll give it to Arthur to distribute. It's got Beth's name on the front. Beth Brandstatter is our IR person who will work with any of you if you have an interest. And in, well, obviously we have full documents and so forth for people to see. And with that, I'll, um, Arthur, I'll turn it back over to you and you know, you pepper us with questions. We, we, lo we love talking about it. Yeah, that's great. We got a bunch. So um, I found fascinating and if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit more about how the relationship with the tribes came about sure so um so i think as i mentioned that the the most people in the hemp industry were thinking about inner city because that's the people who bore the brunt of that of the drug part of of hemp we began to sit back and say wait a second you know what there might be another story part of that's because i'm in new mexico and large native population here and i was introduced to arthur frawa our extraordinary partner who came and visited. And we said, you know, there's an opportunity here. When we look at, you know, the Native American story, we look at what they do, what's the problems they face on the reservations in particular. It started with housing. Could we said, you know, housing is the number one problem. Um, and, you know, part of that was, well, wait a second, could they actually grow some of the materials? And that led us into this much deeper discussion. You know, I've had the privilege of spending several weekends with the Osage Indians in Oklahoma. Um, learning about, you know, that, that it turns out that Native Americans are probably better stewards of our land than anyone. They, they, they took care of the United States long before it was the United States. And so that has led us to these conversations. Um, as, you, as you know, um, the uh, new Secretary of the Interior um, is a Native American woman here from Albuquerque. Um, and so we're deep in discussions at, all, at many, many levels, from the individual tribal level to the level at the Bureau of Indian Affairs to the Senate the Senate committees. Um, and it's our belief that, you know, the way I, I glibly say it is, look, we gave Native Americans the three addictions, gambling, alcohol, and tobacco. Why don't we give them something that, by the way, creates value, creates a circular economy, and is good for the world, and that is carbon. And so, you know, our, our deep in our ethos is this notion that the Native Americans can benefit. There's 55 million acres of land controlled by Native Americans in the United States. And, and our hope is that that becomes the main place in which we do the kind of large scale industrial farming that can be done here. 
So those of us that are uninformed, including myself, would think that how are you going to grow hemp in the, the desert, by definition? <laughs> and why hasn't something else been grown there to help uh, the indigenous people of the United States? So there's, uh, uh, when you said earlier that uh, the uh, California might be the best place, but in the meantime, uh, you've sort of cut your teeth in, in New Mexico. I happen to know the story about how you got involved, but uh, can you talk about um, how you're gonna make that happen? Sure, sure, thanks. Uh, so there are um, 574 recognized, federally recognized tribes in the United States. If you, you know, we, we, each of us can probably name 10 of the 574. Um, while we think of um, the, the reservation land as, as dry and barren, because you think of in particular, like say here in New Mexico, um, on the Navajo reservation, which has a lot of desert, turns out there's a lot of land controlled by Native Americans that is not desert. Um, uh, as an example, we're deep in conversations with the Yakima Indians. That's a million three acres along the Columbia River in Washington, half of which is deep forest, half of which is um, uh, farmland. So it turns out that there's plenty of farmland to grow industrial hemp. My comment about California, by the way, is for cannabinoid rich hemp. That's sort of a, a different kind of the industrial growth. So that it turns out Montana, Kansas, Nebraska, Texas are great places to grow industrial hemp. Um, you do need water, but you don't need massive amounts of water. By the way, you can repair the soil. Part of the story about regenerative agriculture, if Brando, I don't know, if Brando was online, he's giving us the lecture now that if you put that biochar into the ground, even in the desert, as they are doing in the Sahara, you can reclaim that land. So there's plenty of opportunity. Now, why, Arthur, you asked a really good question, though, to me. Why hasn't it happened to date? Well, there hasn't been a compelling, you know, there hasn't been a sort of compelling argument of why that land should be recovered, right? For industrial farming and growing corn. Corn is water intensive, but it's grown in similar areas. Um, and it's just never made a priority. And it wasn't made a part priority in the Department of Agriculture in terms of Indian land. So we think that the opportunity is there. I'm not, I'm, I'm not naive enough to think it's going to be easy and it's going to happen overnight, but I think it does happen and there's plenty of land to do it. So one of the things that we talked about earlier, and I'm not sure the model has changed, is it your intention to, for the lack of me not knowing the right term and use a familiar one to draw an analogy that you'll eventually own farms, but you're gonna co-op them at the beginning? But I'm not even sure we'll eventually own them. Wait, wait, because I think the answer is that farmers, we need to make sure that this supply chain allows people who have land to make a living off that land, right? And make them the focus of that. So we, while, while I think we may acquire some property we own, you know, we own several hundreds of acres. I think we're more interested now in, in partnering with the tribes as an example, we use this example, helping them turn their land into productive land and use the products from that land, not just the carbon credits, which are important, but also the building materials and or other, other industrial products as part of their, econom their economics and their economy. Think of us more of as a technical advisor there, and we'll be a participant and a co-owner perhaps and licensor, but the idea for us is not to, in particular Native Americans, not to say, sell us your land or give us your land, but rather let us help you enable making this land productive. We'll all do well if we do that. So many of us are familiar with this, and so I don't bring it up to be negative, but um, I know people are thinking about sovereign immunity. And so how do you get to a place as a business doing business with the tribes and not be subject to that? So um, that's why you don't want to own the land that is under their control, right? The answer is you want to be a provider of services and of expertise with going in with your eyes wide open, by the way, that they are sovereign nations. Um, and make sure that what you're providing is something that's required. And by the way, maybe in 10 years after they've learned and any given tribe says, you know, we don't need Santa Fe Farms anymore for this particular thing, be accepting. Don't have a lot of your assets there because that's that's the real risk on sovereign, right? A, a sovereign immunity, which someone says, I'll take your assets. So, but we, I, I can tell you that in my interactions and Rogers and um, that I think there's a, a a very large and lengthy window here to work with many of the tribes in a very constructive way with your eyes open, with the sovereignty. I, I'm, I'm not suggesting you close your eyes and do it, but you do it that way. I also think, by the, I don't wanna over, 
although obviously we think about everything we can through the Native American lens, there's plenty of other land and other people, and we'll, we will be doing no things doubt. outside yeah. as well. Yeah. So our good friend, Stellar Human, the best IP attorney on the planet, Pete Thurlow. How about that for a little commercial? He happens to be a very good friend, and he's, and he's eating a hemp. What, what, what did he say, Kim? <laughs> uh, hemp something or other. Blueberry uh, granola. granola. I asked him if he could share. As we yes. speak. Uh, Pete asks, have you reached out to Deb Halland's office as she is the first Native American Interior Secretary? So the answer is um, not only have we reached out to her, but Roger Frau um, is, um, she's from the Laguna Pueblo, as is Roger. I mean, as, and, and she's half Laguna, half Jemez. And, and so, in fact, she is a colleague of, of the person who leads our effort. Um, we're, so so that she's totally aware of what we're doing. We're focused, however, first not in interior, but in agriculture. So the Department of Ag is where our first real push is because that's really where you see, that's where the money is, to be very honest, in terms of helping these tribes begin to marshal the resources necessary to make the investments here. And so we're, we have a, a very, very wonderful sort of lobbying effort right now, but, but Deb is included in that as is Tom Vilsack, Secretary of Agriculture, um, as are others that we're working with there. Super cool. So uh, we we talked about this before uh, we uh, launched the webinar, but we had some friends reach out, uh, new friends from uh, Africa. Uh, Bentley's asking, what is the business phasing plan to get to positive revenue? All right. So um, at, right now, obviously, we're in the investment phase. So we're acquiring businesses. We're um, doing the things that we need to to set the foundation. Um, if, if you ask me to put a crystal ball and say, when will we, we be cash flow negative? I would tell you it's 2023 is when that happens. But I think that you're gonna see us with significant revenues as it is now. We have a massive seed operation. We're, we're working with you know, several thousand acres of farmers. So you know, what will be revenue um, generating, um, we are already our business. But I think that it's, you've got about a, a, a two to three year from when we started sort of J curve, as they like to call it in this business, before we begin to see the, the real value. There's, there's a lot of investment necessary because there's no infrastructure in the business. Think about this, you know, this was the 90 year prohibition problem. Um, and so there, there's, you know, a good 18 more months of investment. The, I, I don't know the details of this, but I've been told that the many parts of the rest of the world have been planting and harvesting hemp for generations. Is there uh, an ability to glean information from them about how to grow this? Um, um, absolutely. It's not just how to grow this, but, but how to process it and where it's used. Although, interestingly enough, you know, when the U.S. and Canada and North America really shut this down, um, you know, they, there hasn't been as much advancement as you might suspect. The place where the most advanced work is in China. That is where the largest amount of hemp is grown. Um, it stays there. They use it for a variety of purposes. So there's certainly much to be learned that, you know, the best today, the best cortication systems, I think, are coming out of the Ukraine. But that's going to shift because all of that is moving. You know, we, if you think about supply chain management and if COVID taught us anything in this country, um, we're going to be focused on the domestic supply chain here. Having said that, we're, we're looking, as, as Kim mentioned, there's work in Zimbabwe, there's work in South America. So um, there's much to be learned, but it, the industry largely is not as far along as you would suspect, even in the places that didn't derail it. I mean, we, we still make too many houses and we still cut down too many trees to make houses. And, and even though that technology, that will change, that will change. Uh, at the risk of sounding silly, the closest fire to the house may not be the building materials for cinder block uh, to build homes, but I've heard that there's some really interesting uh, benefits from using hemp building materials in, in that form, perhaps. Yeah, no. So um, I think many people, the, the, many people, when you first see the word hemp, hemp in building materials, think of hempcrete. They're for the last 20 years, they've been working on the development of sort of replacing the sand with the the, the straw, so to speak, that comes from hemp. Turns out it makes it cheaper, lighter. Um, more effective. By the way, it's fire retardant, 
by the way, it sequesters carbon continually. There's lots of things. It hasn't been structural, however. One of the problems with hempcrete has been that you can use it for a filler, but it can't replace the framing in the building. And now there are just beginning, including research that we're doing, to figure out how to basically create a structural-based hemp material so that you can not use trees and timber to build your house um, and build other office buildings and processing centers. So um, I think that, that as you saw in our case, we're, we're sort of pretty far along in the discussion here of, of how to do that. And, and you can expect us and others around the world to develop these structural hemp-based building products. Yeah. Uh, if it's okay, may I ask Kim a question about her experience thus far, even though it's, you know, at its nascent stages in the adoption or reaction or the awareness of the uh, uh, pulp business in using this at scale? Pulp meaning paper? Yes. Um, so, you know, it's interesting at uh, ArcView, we were approached by many in industry to evaluate certain types of uh, replacement or displacement opportunities and, and paper and cardboard in particular. Also, um, packaging materials was very much a center focus for many companies. We use, uh, I think there's 100 billion boxes that are produced in the United States on an annual basis, cardboard boxes. That's just the U.S. And if you think about it, we're not even the largest producer of those boxes. They come out of China. And so there's a tremendous opportunity to do so. However, what I think Stephen was saying before is that in order for a large paper user to convert, there needs to be a process that happens that allows them to have a reliable supply chain. And right now that doesn't exist. And it will require investment. And so our approach is to work with industry instead of shaming them, which we've been doing for a long time and being carbon output. We're going to allow them to take their capital, invest in this industry with us, and create these processes together so that we have not just the raw materials and the, and the ingredients that they need, but they can now take those ingredients and ingest them into the paper milling slash paper processing that needs to happen without triggering, you know, new EPA rules and recertifications of plants and things like that in the United States that would happen. And so we're really looking at this from a win solution for the industry. And, you know, it's not just paper, but it's all sorts of things. I mean, we're looking at, you know, automakers in Detroit who want to incorporate, you know, biomaterials and bioplastics, and they're really looking at hemp and they're saying, we want this as a solution, help us get there, but we need 90,000 acres planted just for one pilot project, you know? So it's a, it's a big game, but we are, as I said, aligning with these industry players, the ones that are, want to be the first mover, they're going to get a lot of carbon credit, plus they're going to be able to replace these products that really aren't good for us. I mean, the planet. Yeah. There's been a lot of talk about how, uh, I'm going to use the wrong words, unpure the hemp oil in, in consumer products now, and you can't really tell what's what, and is, is how, how, how long do we have a credible uh, method of analyzing that whatever's being used and what we're using is uh, the best that can be uh, bought? So, you know, right now we're under grass, right? Because it's really tough. There's no FDA approval yet. You're talking about the oils that we're ingesting, like under CBD side. That's been, that's been a tough one, really. I mean, if you look at some of the big players that wanted to get into CBD right away, there's still some on the wait and see approach. You know, Coca-Cola isn't making beverages with CBD in it yet. We can't ingest uh, hemp oil or CBD oil in the ways in which we would like to. And we're studying that. I mean, FDA is doing some really interesting things um, to study cannabinoids in humans, and they're fast-tracking that because they recognize that the industry wants to roll and they want to advance, but, you know, we've got these, these processes that need to happen. Um, so the purity and the quality is really now back to the manufacturer and who's behind it. And that's where Santa Fe Farms, we're behind this. We know from the seed, from the genetic, all the way through the farming practice, what's going in the ground, what's, you know, coming out of the ground, how it's being uh, manufactured and processed, what chemicals are used or better yet not used in that process, 
We also have our own lab. And so we're very unique in the fact that we are really walking the walk, right, Stephen? I mean, we're testing our own products too, which is really phenomenal. You know, so Arthur, I'm, just from a, a, an investor perspective, here's how I've thought about this now, having now spent you know, the better part of three years here focused. There is, I think the, the, the first question people had three years ago is, is hemp going to be a real thing? Is it going to be an industry? Is it, a lot of people talked about it. And I think that question has been answered and it is going to be a thing. There is just no question about it. And so this is going to be a major part of an, you know, in some way it's a, sort of its own, the hemp revolution, like the industrial, it's going to be incorporated in a raft of products driven hugely by the focus on carbon now. That, that just answered the question. I think the next thing for me as an investor is, is does the, given that it's a new industry, no one can really tell you what's going to happen, right? So the question is, if I'm an investor, do I think the team of people that I'm going to allow to shepherd my capital, or do I have the right team of people to make those judgments? And so we focused on assembling a team. We focused obviously on each of the industries and where it is and looking at TAM and all those kinds of things that you see. But for me, the next piece of this puzzle was, do I have the right people around the table so that when we're confronted with the problem or we have to do the pivot, do we have that? And, and I feel incredibly proud of the team at Santa Fe Farms. And I think we will be one of the winners in this sector. Now, are we going to be in the building products business? Is, that, is it going to be the pulp and paper business? Is it going to be animal feed business? I don't know. I don't know. We, we will look at all of those and make those judgments as we see. One of the reasons that we're going to go out and raise a significant amount of capital in the fall is to be in a position to take advantage, do the research, as Kim said, have the full understanding of the full chain, and then go ahead and make this. But, but, but there will be multi-billion dollar businesses in the hemp space. There's just no question about it. And, you know, and, and it's Kim and my and our team's belief that we can be one of those players. Yeah, the, the thing that we don't know a lot of things for sure in general in life, but one thing having uh, had some experience in business as well is that building a business is a series of adjustments. And so if you have a team that can adjust, um, yeah, I don't like the word pivot because it reminds me of the Friends episode when they're trying to get <laughs> to the stairwell, but the you know, if you're paying attention and you've got a good team, people don't get stuck on things that don't work and they know how to adjust because all it is is a series of adjustments. Uh, well said, well said. So I, I wasn't trying to be well said, but there you go. Um, <laughs> the uh, This has been super helpful. So there, people can buy two units, three units, four units. Uh, you have all the data. You have all the documents. You've already had a, a, a significant amount of commitment on this round. We're going to make sure everybody gets in touch with you. Um, what is the, without disclosing what you don't want to say, if there's anything or things that you just don't know yet, what's that next round look like to, to the extent that you can share it? Um, so I, I can tell you what's our intent. I, we, we um, Kim and I and our team are working now on the documents. We're working with a group of people. Um, I think we will target 125 million as the raise. That I think will be our target. Um, the way I'd say is I think that roughly half of that will go towards new acquisitions. We have a long list of targets. Roughly half will be invested in our existing businesses and partnerships that are being developed. Um, you know, the, the what I can say is that Today's valuation for what we're selling our, um, our existing, the, these last 20 shares is a fraction of what it will be when we go to the institutions this fall. Um, you know, we're, our, our valuation is a little complicated because we have a very attractive, our A3 round is a participating preferred, meaning that the money comes off the table first before it, before it converts to common and then it's not one or the other. Um, you know, the, so somewhere you can look at our valuation today, it's somewhere between you know, 30 and 40, depending how you want to think of it, because it's a participating, because, you, you know, if we, if we were to sell the business for 17 million, everyone gets their money back. So um, I would tell you that the valuation in the next round will be a, a significant multiple of that number. Um, we, we haven't changed our valuation for a while, but, but the story and now the full team. So um, we probably should do it for this round, but I, um, you know, it's mostly friends and family. And so I, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm a person that believes that, that early, early investors should enjoy the benefits of when we, when be, we be, be rewarded. <laughs> yeah, right. 
So is there anybody uh, at, at any level, no, that's probably not the way, right way. Is there anybody that's been so thoughtful that could be a potential competitor uh, on your coattail, so to speak? I'll let Kim, I'll let Kim answer this because, you know, Kim has, at our view, they looked at everybody. They've been watching the industry and I'll, I'll let her give you, I, I kind of know what she's going to say, but I'll, I'll let her tell you the story. So I can't change the story. Darn it. I was going to up, up level it a bit. So that is, uh, so here's, here's why I'm here is, you know, our view looks at probably about 300 companies a month that are seeking capital. There's about $600 million worth of deal flow right now still um, going through all of the ArcView uh, companies. So Venture, our broker dealer, you know, so we're looking at companies that are going public, um, a lot in the hemp space, a lot of consulting deals are coming through on hemp. And I could not find a leader. I, I could find a lot of great point and shoot type companies. So companies that were looking at one part of the supply chain or one product in the supply chain. A lot of CBD, so a lot of activity in that market because that was early entry. People made a lot of money in one year <laughs> and then started losing money in year two and three. Um, but for me, I didn't see a leader in this space. And having been in the oil business and working with oil companies and, and knowing how to introduce new technology without disrupting their supply chain, it's not that difficult if you give them that right pathway, but you have to be very thoughtful. And so when Stephen has said, this is what we're doing, this is the team that we're assembling, we are going to couple you know, the, the farm and the genetics and the people who understand hemp with those who really understand this industry and the supply chain and marrying those two together, I'm like, hell yeah, I'm in. Because no one is approaching the market that way. And this, and Arthur, this is a $500 million investment to start. We need billions of dollars to create the next hemp X or hemp superhighway or, you know, hemp industrial, whatever you want to call it. But in order for hemp to be a solution for any one of those things, let's just take chicken feed, right? Let's just take chicken feed. In order for hemp to be a solution for that, we have to farm, you know, millions of acres basically of, of crop just to feed chickens for the United States. Yeah, it's right? big. It's big. It's big. Well, super interesting. Um, Let me add one more thing on that, though, yeah, if I could. Yeah, of course. And by the way, and the other, and the other piece for me is Stephen has managed and continues to manage billions of dollars for other people. So if I were going to entrust my family wealth and part of that to someone because I believe in this cause and I want to work on carbon from a planet perspective, who else are you going to give your money to to make that happen? No, I no. totally agree with that sentiment. So um, I still uh, owe Brando uh, a lot for a lot of things, including this. So there. There you go. Um, so we have to wrap it up, guys. But you want to close it up, Stephen? Oh, just um, thank you, everyone, for taking the time. And, and we, whether you end up investing or not, this, this the hemp revolution is coming. It is remarkable. I, I, you know, again, the ecological and social aspects here are incredibly important for us as a company. It's 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 not just about making money. We'll make plenty of money here. It's about the idea that we can make it in a way that both improves the lives of, of really an, an, of indigenous peoples throughout the world, ultimately, as well as good for our planet and good for our environment and good for my granddaughter. So thank you for taking the time today. I like that mind too. Well, thank you, Steve. Thank you. thank you, Kim. Very nice to meet you. And thank you for your contribution. And as I always say uh, uh, to, to the attendees, thank you for spending the only thing you can't make more of, and that's your time with us today. Until next time, take care. Bye-bye. Thanks.